I've arrived in Berlin, and I'm about to take the U-Bahn, which is the German equivalent of the underground, to Museum Island. Museum Island is exactly what it says on the tin. It's a collection of five museums, built over a period of about 100 years, from 1830 to 1930, on an island. Today I'm going to be visiting the New Museum. Even though the name is the New Museum, it's actually over 150 years old, and isn't even the newest on the island. The new museum was heavily damaged during World War II. As such, the centre court collection represents a mix. Here we have Canaan statues, over here some Egyptian hieroglyphs, while around the walls you can see a Greek frieze. You can also see a lot of damage to the walls. The walls were heavily bombed during the end of World War II when Germany was shelled by the Allies. But luckily for us, some treasures remain, such as this Assyrian war relief. Much of the museum, outside that central section, which is a memorial to the war and to ancient history, is actually dedicated to Egyptian artefacts. Here you can see several things, such as a plough from the ancient Egyptians' agricultural society, the Kingdom of the Egyptians was founded by the Nile, and was one of the longest running civilizations, lasting for several thousand years. The Egyptians made many normal objects. Here you can see a mirror on the right, and also several vessels. They even had board games, such as this one here. I don't know exactly how it worked, but you can imagine it perhaps being something similar to Trivial Pursuit. The Egyptians had their own script, which was very complicated, known as hieroglyphics. These hieroglyphs and sculptures were marked into the walls of many of their monuments. The new museum differs from many other European collections, as it has periods across all different time periods of ancient Egypt, including the one you've seen just before, from the Nubian period, when the southern kingdom, which is now Sudan, invaded Egypt proper and occupied it for several hundred years. It also has later pieces, such as this, with the tomb and sarcophagus we're about to see. So there are several thousand years of history, even after the classical ancient Egyptian period, with pharaohs and sarcophagi like these, that people are most familiar with. The Egyptians placed a great deal of emphasis on the afterlife throughout the thousands of years of their kingdom. And this didn't just extend to people, it also covered animals such as cats, which were often mummified or preserved in statues, like this one. The first floor of the museum has been extensively restored by the British architect David Chipperfield following damage during the war. It's on this floor that you can find war carvings from tombs. Standing amongst them, I almost feel like some form of British version of Indiana Jones. In the next room, they have a series of Egyptian heads, dating across thousands of years and multiple dynasties. What struck me was not so much that there was change amongst these heads over the centuries, but the sense of continuity as they carved the heads of their leaders and figureheads into immortal stone. The sculptures themselves encompass a wide range of materials, but probably my favourite of all of these is this green head, which you will see here, carved into a very hard stone, from which they were able to get the most excellent finish. The eternal eyes of this overseer almost seem to stray out at us from several thousand years. From this point on, the remainder of the museum is a slightly odd mix. Not only do you have a few remaining Egyptian sculptures, but because part of the Egyptian collection was damaged, you also have this slightly odd room, which has Dark Age objects, but yet with a very nice Egyptian ceiling, dating from before the museum was damaged. There is then an extensive collection from the German Dark Ages. This was the time of kings such as Charlemagne and the Holy Roman Emperors. 
Some of these pieces are simple pottery, but others, which you'll see shortly, are rather more impressive. Here, for instance, you have a sword from one of the early Frankish kings. For some odd reason, they've thrown in a cast of the doors of Florence Baptistry here. I've no idea why they've done this, as it has no relation whatsoever to the Dark Ages. Perhaps they just needed somewhere to stick them, or they were impossible to move, because they were too delicate. The rest of the Dark Age section has a lot of very nice jewellery. As you can see here from these earrings. The Dark Ages were a time when few people could read and it was important to advertise your status through very visible jewellery, swords and other items of Dark Age bling. While most of the Roman sculptures are in other museums on the island, there are a few here, such as this one of Helios, the Sun God. There is also a very unusual survival, this, the bronze boy of Xanthin. Many of the bronze statues from the Roman period and Greek periods were melted down, so this is very unusual. And that concludes our tour of the new museum. Of course, if there's an island full of museums, I'm unlikely to simply stop with one. I've now headed to the Pergamon Museum. This museum features monumental architecture from across many different periods. Here we have some of the early works from the Babylonian civilization. This gate, known as the Gate of Ishtar, was made partly from original bricks found in Iraq and partly from recast bricks. The size of it, which would have greeted a triumphal monarch such as Nebuchadnezzar on the way to Babylon, is absolutely staggering, as is the decoration and the rich blue and gold colours. The Pergamon Museum's extensive large-scale architectural collection does not just cover the Ishtar Gate, it also covers the Pergamon Altar, but this is not visible at present because it is currently undergoing renovation and restoration works. There is, however, a large-scale Roman piece remaining, which is this one, the Market Gate of Miletus. Here you can see a Roman emperor gesturing towards this magnificent construction across two stories which would have greeted travellers when they came to the city. The gate was dug up in what is now Turkey in the early years of the 20th century and extensively restored on the orders of the German Emperor. This was not necessarily a popular move as some architectural purists would have preferred it to remain largely as it was but you can see here from this Greek inscription that around the room there are several original artifacts preserved largely as they were found, which goes some way to offsetting the criticism. As well as the large gate, there is also a central mosaic here devoted to the god Bacchus. Reflecting Imperial Germany's extensive links with the Ottoman Empire, here we have a wonderful room from Syria. This originally would have been part of a church and the decoration is Christian, although it is in a highly Islamic or Oriental style, which looks unfamiliar to our Western eyes. Thankfully this has been saved from the bombing of Aleppo. In addition, the Museum for Islamic Art, which is a part of the Pergamon Museum, has an extensive collection of rugs from the Ottoman Empire and also from the Mughal Empire in India, 
As you can see, these are major works and would have taken a long time for a team of weavers to be able to craft. Here we have some tiles from Iznik in Turkey. This was the finest porcelain ware that the Ottoman Empire produced. This is the remains of an Umayyad palace from the early Islamic era. It's currently undergoing extensive restoration and therefore we cannot get very close to it. But you can see the level of incredible detail in the carvings. Here we have a couple of mirabs from different parts of the Islamic world. Mirab is a prayer niche which shows the direction that Muslims should pray towards Mecca. They are a key part of mosques. Finally, here we have a wonderful carved ceiling from the Palace of Alhambra in Spain, which was created during the Islamic period. With that, it's time to leave behind a Pergamon Museum and finish my first day in Berlin.